Now let's move on to talk about the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect is pretty cool. This is the thing that when you are perhaps standing on the side of a road and a emergency vehicle goes by, it makes a high-pitched sound as it's coming to you. And then it has that lower pitch sound as it moves past you. It's fairly well understood why the pitch changes in that situation, and we call that the Doppler effect. My favorite example to demonstrate the Doppler effect is with a little race car. And so I'm showing my little race car track here. We're going to zoom in on this orange vehicle that's down here by the stands. I'm going to put up a little definition of the Doppler effect. The perceived frequency, that is the frequency at the detector, so that would be your ear in most situations, can be different from the frequency of the source depending on the relative motion between the thing that's making the sound and the thing that is actually hearing the sound. Let's see how that works. Zooming in on my orange car here, I'm going to start with a scenario where the car is going to be at rest. The source of the sound is going to be the car's engine. And then the detector is going to be some individual out in the audience here that I'm showing down at the south end of the slide. As time progresses, we could see that a wave could start to propagate out as the sound is developing. So we're looking at an overhead view of our wave. It's traveling out in all directions. As that wave reaches the people in the audience, they will be able to hear it. We're they're going to have alternating high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure regions that are going to hit their eardrums and they're going to perceive a sound. You can see that the wavelength of the sound and the frequency of the sound can be somewhat demonstrated in this slide here. Let's now take a look at what would happen when the car is actually moving. In this case, I have the car moving from left to right, and it's producing the sound as it travels. Notice that every time it makes a new, say, uh, crest in the sound, it seems to be compressed towards the direction of travel. This is fundamentally what we are talking about when we say the Doppler effect. If the source is moving, then it will tend to cause a compression in the direction of motion. And what it leaves behind is an elongation of the wavelength. Now, for individuals that are sitting in the stand, they're going to perceive the frequency being a little different here because they are going to come across this situation where there doesn't seem to be as much physical distance between the different crests that are coming into their ear. So you're going to have more crests coming into the ear per time and that is going to result in a perceived higher frequency into your ear even though the frequency of the car may be perfectly constant. Now for somebody that's on the back side of this thing that elongation means that they're going to see crests and troughs alternating coming through less frequently which is going to be a lower frequency or a lower pitch and it's going to have a lower sound to it. There's an equation we can use to look at the Doppler effect. In fact there are a lot of different variations of this equation you might see. I'm choosing to show this particular one because this is what's shown in the textbook that I use. Let's go ahead and define some of these terms here. First of all, let's look at the V with no subscript. That is indicating the speed of sound. And so, again, for most situations that we're concerned with, the speed of sound is going to be 343 meters per second. That's pretty easy to take care of. These two variables that I've identified here, that subscript S is being used to indicate the source. And so the script F, subscript S, is the frequency of the source and the velocity of the source is the one that shows up in the denominator and then we have the subscript D is for detector we have the velocity of the detector and the frequency of the detector so all of these things are related through this particular equation and we're going to take a look at two different scenarios the same scenarios we just saw uh, with the race car moving by I am showing that the race car is traveling from left to right. I've selected a velocity of 75 meters per second for the purposes of this problem. 
I've also selected 1000 Hertz as the frequency of the source. Sound always travels from the source to the detector, so I'm showing that the sound is traveling from left to right. Certainly you well know that sound is also traveling uh, behind the car, but it's interesting given that I started with the tree scenario. If a tree falls in the woods and no one's around to hear it, well if nobody is back behind the car to hear it, I'm not interested in those sound waves. And so I'm just not going to even look at the sound that's going behind the vehicle unless I have somebody over there to detect it. So over on this side, I have my ear that is indicating the detector. I want to know what frequency will this individual hear. Uh, we're going to say that they are standing stationary in this example. The way that I prefer to think of these problems is I always like to treat the direction that sound is traveling towards the detector as the positive direction. From there, I will make adjustments on any of my negative signs to account for that accordingly if it's moving in a different direction than sound. But in this case, the right direction is the positive direction. From there, I can plug in my numbers. I've got the speed of sound here, the speed of sound there. Notice that I get a minus sign strictly from the equation. I have minus 0 in the numerator, minus 75 below. I'm going to simplify that down. My meters per second units will cancel, and I can really further simplify this down to a factor of 1.28, and I can find that the frequency that is perceived at the detector will be 1,280 hertz, even though the frequency of the source is 1,000, so it actually has a higher pitch sound. Now, for somebody that is standing behind the vehicle, we can look at the same problem and just adjust a couple parameters here. So for someone that's standing behind the vehicle, now I am interested in the sound that's traveling backwards. Notice the direction of sound is to the left. That's also going to become my positive direction. So you'll notice that if my vehicle is still traveling to the right, I've now tagged it with a minus sign so that I can keep track of the idea that the sound is traveling in the opposite direction of the source. I'm using all the same nu numbers otherwise and I can come in and plug in my numbers. The biggest thing that I want to make sure you notice is that again I get one minus sign because of the equation and I've picked up a second minus sign because my car is traveling in the opposite direction of the sound. I can still simplify this down. I have 343 minus 0 in the numerator. Uh, the double negative sign will move to a plus, so I'm going to eventually get 418 in the denominator. I can further simplify that and find that it is a factor of 0.82, the unitless quantity, and that is going to adjust my original frequency, and I find that the frequency at the detector in this case is a perceived lower pitch of 821 hertz. In summary, it's important to remember that sound is a compression wave or a longitudinal wave. Two different ways to say the same thing. We briefly talked about some definitional things and discussed how the, uh, the loudness of a sound is related to the amplitude. I've reminded you that the frequency of a wave is determined by the source and that when we're talking about sound, we usually refer to that frequency as the pitch. The velocity of a wave is determined by the medium, that's 343 meters per second for standard conditions for sound. And then the wavelength you can determine by solving this particular equation. We used an example that middle C had a wavelength that was a little over one meter from crest to crest or from trough to trough. We also talked about the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect, as I mentioned before, is the consequence of having the source moving relative to the detector. In my example that we looked at, I had the source moving with a stationary detector. Keep in mind, you can also have a situation where the detector is moving and the source is stationary, or perhaps both of them are moving in tandem. Oh, and we also identified that if a tree does fall in the forest and nobody's around to hear it, it does make a sound, or at least a compression wave. Don't forget, you can always go back and look at this video again if it went a little bit too quickly, but otherwise, if you think you got it, let your computer know.